Hi, Oliver. Welcome to Only 5 Minutes and thank you for joining us. Thank you so much. Very happy to be here. Now, you're the founder of a research hub called Storage Lab. Can you tell us what the motivation behind the hub was? Storage Lab is really about increasing transparency on the cost of electricity storage technologies, but also on the value these technologies can bring to our power and energy system. I set this up during my PhD because I wanted my research to be more accessible to you know professionals in the industry and also other stakeholders. So it's really a website that shows the research results. Um, but also I started actually working together with startups that are developing novel storage technologies to determine their lifetime cost and then also compare these to the lifetime cost of more established technologies like lithium ion. And then lastly, there's also um, a new tool on the website which allows anyone to determine the profitability of energy storage using the methodology I developed with my colleagues at Imperial College. So, you know, the whole purpose is to increase transparency and enable people to determine the value of storage. Well, with the data at hand on Storage Lab, would you be able to provide a prediction or a 2030 outlook when it comes to battery energy storage pricing across the residential and, and larger segments? I personally think that lithium ion really has a lot of attraction due to the, the, the large scale deployment of electric vehicles, you know, in terms of R&D spending, in terms of production scale up. Um, so I really do think that lithium ion will dominate the stationary storage space after plant hydro, of course, at least up to 2030. Some people would argue against that because last year the prices of lithium ion batteries have increased uh, for the first time. Um, but I think this is really just a short term phenomenon. So, you know, it's quite normal in all industries because supply and demand is not always in balance. And um, you know, we've seen that with solar PV modules, for example, the prices for solar PV modules increased between 2005 and 2008, but also at other times. And that was usually because there was a rapid uptake of solar PV modules um, and there was a shortage in polysilicon. But then new production capacities for polysilicon came online and always after that, the prices for PV modules crashed and the price reduction returned to the long-term trend. And I see no reason why this shouldn't be the case for lithium-ion batteries. So lithium-ion batteries, are, of course, I mean, there's a shortage now because uh, there's a huge scale-up in the deployment of EVs, but new mines, new production capacities are being deployed. And once these come online, I do think that the prices for lithium-ion batteries will return to their long-term production trend. So you know, for people interested in that, um, I just finished writing a book called Monetizing Energy Storage, and that compiles the cost reduction data for the most common storage technologies, um, which is a good reference point, and that should be out uh, by summer 2023. Um, but you also asked about other technologies, and I do think there is potential for other technologies beyond lithium-ion and contrario to be deployed, especially in the utility scale sector. Um, and I see two avenues for that. The first avenue is really lower upfront costs, um, and that could be driven by fundamentally lower raw material costs. You need to see classical electrochemical batteries, they need high quality metals that are electrically active. Gravity-based storage solutions can use any material like water or cement. So the materials could be fundamentally cheaper. Also, there's a lot of development of liquid metal batteries at the moment. They work at high temperatures and that allows lower quality but cheaper metals to also work. And so the challenge here really is, you know, to find the engineering concepts that make these uh, materials work for energy storage. But that's still uncertain. So the second avenue where other technologies can be deployed is in applications where lithium ion is very unlikely to be competitive. So this is long discharge durations, maybe more than eight hours. Yeah, here we have compressed air, compressed CO2, liquid air, hydrogen, a range of these technologies. And the other one is really high annual charge discharge cycles, maybe more than 500 per year. So here technologies like flow batteries or flywheels can really play that one. You mentioned hydrogen there, Oliver. Now, I understand that you've done quite a bit of research when it comes to the cost and performance of electrolyzers. What can you tell us about your findings? That's very interesting. So in 2017, I was interviewing European manufacturers uh, of electrolyzers on the cost development. And Roughly, the, the high-level message was that cost could reduce from 1,000 euros per kilowatt 
to 500 euros per kilowatt by 2030. But this research is actually outdated because nowadays there are Chinese manufacturers of electrolyzers who offer systems at 200 to 300 euros per kilowatt, apparently at lower quality. But this really reminds me of another industry, and again, it's the solar industry, uh, which was initially based in Europe due to leading research institutes, local policy incentives. But then China entered the market um, at lower costs, but also lower quality. However, over time, the quality of the modules increased, and now Chinese players are dominating the solar PV space. So what does that mean for electrolyzers? That means on the one side, I'm actually quite nervous for the European electrolyzer industry. But on the other side, I'm very happy and confident that electrolyzers seem to be on the same cost reduction trajectory as solar PV modules and lithium-ion batteries. And that will remove at least one of the barriers to scale up the hydrogen industry. Mm -hmm.